Okay, uh, so it's been a long time because of uh, difficult circumstances and coordination issues. Um, so there's a lot of things we want to catch up on because it's been a long time since our previous discussion. And uh, my mind is uh, buzzing a lot with trying to keep it all organized because modern world things are happening very fast a lot of changes a lot of changes in i think uh our observations about things since last time our last um, uh, our last so of course one of the first things we should do is probably uh revisit especially some of my uh completely incorrect <laughs> speculations um so, but yeah, here we are. It's December. Yeah, we're going into a nice cold Canadian winter. It's going to yeah. be amazing. The last time we talked, Jason Kenny had uh, had had uh, fumbled the best summer ever. But there no, was he whole... hadn't. Not at that time. Oh, really? I'm pretty sure the last time we talked, <laughs> it was like open for good. Well, at first it was open for summer, and then somewhat tepidly they started putting out the uh, open for good. Yeah. And then uh, after like about two months of summer, that was closed again. <laughs> then it was back to put the mask back on your face, close your bars early. Yeah. And then in another two weeks, it was um, uh, you need the medical passport, which... Oh. Which, of course, he had previously in the summer said that he would never do. So did Justin Trudeau, though. Yeah, well, pretty much everyone did. And then it changed to the point where Trudeau was offering a billion dollars for implementation. And so basically, I think that's just free money for these governments to line their pockets with. So that's a good incentive with. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, it's not open for good. It's actually, despite this unprecedented vaccination campaign 85%. that's supposedly gonna flatten the curve for good this time 85 percent um cases have kind of like exploded all over these like <laughs> places in different parts of the world scotland um, Ireland, it's bad yeah and uh in a lot of ways we seem like we're more locked down than we were before there were any vaccines yeah and now we've created this uh, unclean leper class of unvaccinated people which is the target of all this uh, derision and sometimes uh, further interference with their lives if they're not choosing to take the uh, medicine required. I have, but, I have a question. <clears throat> so most of these politicians came out fully like, oh, it's never going to happen. We're not going to do it. Sounds like a human rights violation to me. Um to like we got to do this um and they could just be like well you know our hospitals are full yada yada and and so there tends to be uh especially from the right against uh the left the pointing out of hypocrisy they're like oh you remember when you did that well that's not consistent with what you're doing and what you're saying and that seems to be the only thing the right is able to do is, is point out hypocrisy like it matters. Like these people have shame. Oh yeah. They've got no shame. It's, um, it's, it's totally pathetic. It's an exercise of impotence. It's a reflection that you don't have the power. Cause like, like the great evil, a uh, political philosopher once said, uh, uh, you know, if you're like political power is about you get to decide the exception, like you get to decide when uh, hypocrisy doesn't matter. Because, again, you're you're in that privileged position where the normal rules don't apply to you. So the next step after pointing out someone's a hypocrite is to and, and nothing changes is to mock them. Uh, no one's really doing enough mocking. I mean, there's only so smug Tucker Carlson can get, uh, and it, it hasn't changed anything. Like, I don't care how, how many like weird looks you give into the camera or how many college or professors like you dunk on and shuffle your papers. The mocking is not hard enough to make them 
question what they're doing because there's 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 no feedback loop in their kind of day-to-day life to fix them so mocking isn't working either either it's got to be more people doing it or it's got to be more severe but the question is what happens after mocking what is to be done with these people uh if if the it's shown to be not in good faith because they don't give a fuck about being hypocrites. They have no shame. They can't be mocked into uh, kind of coming to a consensus. What's next? Well, uh, look, the the right, and I guess conservatives especially, um, are generally prone to pessimism. And so complaining about hypocrisy and mockery, those are uh, coping mechanisms. Cope. So the next coping mechanism um, doesn't really matter because it's kind of like uh, not an end in itself. It could be anything, but um, I don't know. Probably doesn't matter that much. Where's, Where's my conservative Antifa? My brown shirts. Um, <laughs> no, like, I don't know. Do you think people who LARP in a militia, um, like militias are just a big cope? I think it's basically all retarded people. Yeah? Yeah. How many, if you were to join a militia, how many do you think would be CIA and FBI? 50 (laughs) percent they would probably start it yeah the way they started like the victoria day parade like uh terrorist plot and the toronto wasn't there someone with a train toronto 17 yeah yeah there was uh yeah the train stuff and uh the plot to assassinate stephen harper and um yeah, but uh, how did we start talking about this? Uh, the reason why I was talking about that was the uh, hypocrisy of politicians. And uh, there's no mechanism to, like, the best you can do is send Polyev up there to try and dunk on them and ask them how much a, a loaf of bread costs uh, and have his little fucking just inflation tagline. Um. And that's all well and good, but like it, he, and, the, and they have gone from, uh, pointing out what hypocrites they are to now openly mocking them, which seems to be the next step. Right. But what happens when this mockery gets them about as far as the, the illustration of hypocrisy, what do they do? They don't do anything else. They'll do those two things forever. Because they got nothing else. <laughs> wow. Okay, so uh, we have a uh, number of things that have happened anyway. Um, so it's been a few months. It's been since something like August. Yeah. So just starting kind of locally, um, we had a municipal election. Yeah. And... Of course, Alberta urbanites vote kind of, you know, quote unquote, progressively or so it would seem. So you get Jody Gondek or Jay Audi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, Jody Gondek, and she's basically Nenchi. Yeah. She's the like Nenchi and uh, female version. Yeah. Um, like very not smart, very. Uh, um, you know, shallow kind of progressive, uh, dumb causes, but big city people love that kind of stuff. But do you- And maybe the right side was like, you know, split up in a number of ways. And you might say that, uh, things were concentrated around Jody, but, um, I well- think, I think ultimately like it doesn't really matter because the Calgary mayor isn't really that powerful. It's the council as a whole, which is basically 
nine of the uh, nine of the wards are have horrible counselors do you on know, the seats. Do you know so, that they all belong to the same kind of committee? Supported them all. Yeah, there's like uh, the P uh, or uh, the public union uh, political action group or whatever. Uh, yeah, it was all very like coherent on the so-called uh, left or liberal side of the election. Um, and then there was, you know, some people were saying like, oh, Jeff Davison is a, is like slightly conservative and, uh, none of these people really were, but, um, so some people say it was split, but it doesn't really matter in my opinion. I think, uh, big urban cities want so-called, uh, big, dumb kind of leftoid shallow, uh, city policies and that's what they get and the thing is though i think it's all basically a proxy effect or some kind of a proxy relationship with the whole jason kenny thing so i think the provincial government itself is so brutally unpopular that it ripples into both uh the local effect um because oh kenny's on the right supposedly Oh, these candidates are kind of on the right, supposedly. So I want like something less like Kenny. And then, of course, uh, federally, uh, Kenny didn't look good because Aaron O'Toole was associated with him. And Kenny is, of course, the least popular premier in the entire country. They made him go on vacation. Yeah, probably to avoid <laughs> things, which was interesting. But so there was that. Like, I think ultimately it's all about the provincial issue uh because that's where so much uh anger and indignation uh is focused and of course we're in alberta we've got a government that everybody hates and it's really something uh tnc or t like true north <clears throat> they had on uh this uh vitor guy i forget his last name he was also on the, uh, he showed up on the Western Standard during their uh, election coverage. And uh, that, he seems like he gets it. I mean, he's kind of like a real politic kind of guy. And uh, he pointed out that this last review, he's like, the only people that showed up here are just like cronies. There's only cronies here because they're not actually getting the vote done. No one wants to pay like $300 to come and talk shit when it's not going to matter. There's only cronies here. There's no grassroots people. Uh, and they're all saving their money to go and vote in the spring to, to get rid of them. Yeah. And for context, you're talking about the leadership review and the AGM for the UCP party. Yeah. The AGM was just recent. No. Like, so they had a meeting recently. I don't think it was an AGM. Yeah. Though, was it? Yeah. It was an AGM in November. So like they did their thing. No one cares. It's like it's at the casino. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 stupid yeah it's all cronies it's hacks it's uh normal people don't usually go to those things they're just it's like i think everyone just hates the party but, but now now there's um yeah so the leadership thing kenny's supposed to face a leadership review but he set it up so that he'll basically have all his like his buddies voting for him in some obscure place in red deer do you think yeah do you think brian jean's gonna actually uh make a run or yeah, like well, make he, it interesting because like, he's, he's got, terrified of brian jean terrified. so brian jean is of course terrible he sounds like yeah. rachel notley these days and he's pro lockdown and pro medical passport okay and so he offers no real like difference there. He's but basically he's, not Lee or Kenny there. But, but, he's, but people are always, especially on the right, people are always looking for a savior. Yeah. So it's like, oh, Brian Dream. Blah, blah. So yeah, he got the nomination recently. Yeah. Um, over Kenny's guy. And that by election has to be, I don't know, by March or something, or yeah. uh, February or March. So um I mean, Kenny would probably prefer if the NDP win it rather than Gene. And theoretically, that's even possible. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, Gene is, uh, yeah, like Gene seems like he 
is explicitly saying he's going to try and replace Kenny's leadership because he says that's the only way you can potentially avoid the um, the return of the NDP in a couple of years. And that very well might be true. But, um, you know, he's just an opportunist. I, I, I don't have a very positive opinion of him. And he sounds like Rachel Notley. Like, it took him months and months and months to say what he thinks of lockdowns. Yeah. And when he finally did, he said he was pro lockdowns. Like, yep, just trust the experts. Yeah. Um, I defer. And if only we'd locked down harder, we wouldn't be in this mess. So he doesn't get it, at least on that issue. Maybe he's better on some other things, but it's not clear that he is because he's one of these guys. He, again, he sounds like Notley. He says, we need a government we can trust. Then, you know, lockdowns would be more acceptable. Uh, we need to listen, a government that listens to the people and a government that's more transparent what? so that people understand why we do what we do. What the fuck do I need you? It's terrible. So people basically just see not Kenny and that's enough True. because they're pretty shallow. But well, it that... looks like, yeah, you'll get the NDP. Again, you went from best summer ever to big disaster, even though it wasn't really that bad. It's just the healthcare system's trash. Yeah. BC basically had the same problem a month before, and it wasn't made into nearly the issue as it was for Alberta in the media. New Brunswick did the same thing. Yes, later, like, yeah. um, you know, kind of after the big Alberta spike, which followed the big BC spike, New Brunswick had a big, the biggest spike they've ever had. And they're like all vaccinated. They're basically cut off from the rest of the country. My mom. The whole thing is insane. I was talking to my mom this week and she's like you know that we had 50 cases in new brunswick i was like what the fuck is wrong with you people you you've lost the plot you have no idea what's happening no they have no idea it should be the last thing they're worried about now you have 50 positive tests that now and no one trusts and you know what i've noticed that a lot of people are doing now and maybe they've been doing it all along, but it's just more noticeable now because we're kind of in this like sort of limbo where people aren't sure if we're like kind of moving out of it or if it's going to get worse because there's Omicron, huh? yeah. Omicron, yeah, Omicron, yeah. My whole family died of Omicron. Omicron, didn't you just hang on. give it to me? Yeah, we've all got it. We're all going to die. Hopefully, we can finish this recording because it is very dangerous. But. Uh, what was I going to say? Um, symptoms include body ache and headache. No, before that, what were we talking about? Uh, people aren't really sure where things are going. They're, they're kind of like just waiting to see whether they're going to have to get max vaxxed or another set of three shots, sort of like the Pfizer CEO said the other week, uh, or whether like lockdowns are just going to go away or Omicron's going to kill us all or people are like... I don't know if people are just like super anxious and waiting to see which way the herd bolts or if they're so fatigued that they've just, they don't, they're, they're just like a dead horse. Like they're, it's just not nothing. Nothing's going to happen. You, oh yeah. Okay. I remember what I was going to say. So okay. I've, I've just noticing it cause we're kind of in this maybe transitional or like, you know, eye of the storm or I don't even know what to call it, but it seems like there's kind of a weird tension right now between um people kind of like uh is it over or people like oh no we got to be scared again because of omicron right now what i was going to say is people keep talking like covid did this (laughs) or like before covid closed my business yeah um and there's no i think it just really corrupts the way we think because it takes our eye off the real entity that inflicted the wreckage like the virus was not worth turning society upside down for and you know uh your business wasn't closed your family wasn't torn apart you didn't lose your job because of covid you lost it because of the the unvaccinated no it should be before the before the (laughs) lockdowns people should be saying before lockdowns or lockdowns did this lockdowns did that lockdowns ruined my life the unvaccinated ruined uh, my life delayed my cancer treatment lockdowns 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 people say oh the virus did it (laughs) the virus the virus closed my business yeah 
I can't blame anyone. I've seen that. That was in some global thing or something. It's, uh, all these rest, <clears throat> all these restaurants were closed in Vancouver, obviously. Yeah. And they're talking to some different guys, and one guy's like, "Really can't blame anyone except the virus." <laughs> it's like, what? These people cannot be left off the hook. But Canadians just love lockdown so much. But anyway, um, yeah. Well, yeah. So we got there's a provincial issue with Gene. So we're off track. Yeah. Don't no, know, remember where we left off. This is what happens when you have ADD and autism. So I'm, I'm mentally handy. <laughs> I get special treatment. Um. So the. Uh, I was never put in a special class. No. But I was prevented from going on a grade one field trip because of my bad behavior. <laughs> I, and I had to sit in the library all day with some other kid who was like a uh, shithead. Autistic? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've I've experienced that. Um, Just poor social development. I was one of the youngest kids in the class. It makes a big difference. It does. It's like one one fifth of your life difference between you and some other kid. Yeah. And at that age, that's huge. It's huge. Major. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so the, that Vitor guy also said something else that I think was important. He said, normally when you see a political party or a uh, a group in in trouble, um, you see them doing things differently, and you don't see Kenny doing this. So the only thing that I can infer from that is that either A, Kenny's not in trouble, or B, Kenny doesn't think he's in trouble. Well, if I mean it's if his observation's correct, yeah. He so there's two possibilities either he is in trouble or he's not, yeah. And if he is, he either perceives correctly that he is or he does not. So, um, the question there is, is he actually in trouble? And clearly, <laughs> he is, yeah. We know, well, we don't, I guess we don't like have it on record, but it's kind of like you know, this general generally accepted thing that he wants to do some kind of uh federal endeavor that at dream some point. Is, is dead he well, wants to get dead now but he, again we've we've been kind of operating under the assumption and it seems like just one of those weird kind of unspoken truths and maybe it's not even true but it seems true because he is like harper's kind of minion right yeah um so he that seems to be in trouble yeah um and in alberta he's clearly in trouble like what was the what's that stupid um i mean i don't know if it's right or not but 338 maybe is is it that uh that website that just tracks the polls basically oh, so they yeah, put yeah. this chart out for alberta and it said if an election was held today uh you know 100% chance ndp would win 0% chance ucp would win not like you know, it's a pretty big margin. <laughs> I've never seen that on like that's brutal. You know, uh, a political poll like that. But um, so it seems that yes, he is in trouble. Now, does he think he's in trouble, or does he not? Well, he would have to be a total idiot, and he looks like he knows he's on trouble when he's on TV because he yeah. doesn't have any confidence in anything that he says. He seems like he's, you know, his nerves are fried, or he just. Uh, lost his mojo which he basically didn't have anyway because he's a very strange uh very strange man in some ways it's a recurring theme on this show to try and figure out just how stupid he is no he's not stupid he's smart but (laughs) so it seems that he would have to know that he's in trouble but it's possible that he's so arrogant and so uh so confident in his own political abilities that he still thinks he can win but it might be might be like a forest for the truth things. Maybe he thinks he can stay as leader of the party, but if they get wiped out in the election, like he's toast anyway. Yeah. So that should be the only really thing that really matters. And I think they go together, but there's he's basically just saying like, Alberta's back. Alberta's uh, growing so fast. And we got tech investment coming in. Yeah. And movies are shooting here. But it doesn't feel like the no. Al- Alberta is getting better. Everything they do along the way for this virus shit makes society worse and people feel it. And 
you, there is not a sense that things are really good. So there's one absolute key defining thing that promotes business. Stability. Predictability. So if I know what my taxes are going to be in three to five years, I don't care if they're high, but I at least know exactly what they're going to be. If you were to, <clears throat> if you were to get some, some money and some business, some venture capital, and you want to go out there and kind of get things done. Um, one thing that's really important is taking a look at the lay of the land and s looking at what the biggest fish in the pond does, which is the government. And if the government yeah. is completely loose with what they're doing, new rules every week, there's, there's not a, a, a bylaw or rule set that isn't changed weekly when it comes to this stuff. I can have no confidence in my own ability to predict the future and mitigate possible losses or avert disasters if the biggest fish in the pond is constantly changing its mind. That's, yeah, that's 100% true that uh, it's just hazard. You don't want to invest in that environment or you're less likely to invest. And so some people will, but a lot more people won't than otherwise. And so it's, it's necessarily worse and that's going to reduce your future income. But what it also does, of course, is it does reduce our, you know, present income as well. Cause it basically just creates overhead for everything. Like it's an extra expense on your income statement. It's all this trash. Like, okay. So, uh, CFIB, so Canadian Federation of Independent Business, put out some survey from its members. Oh. And so basically the majority said um, vaccine or a medical passport no. uh, has reduced their sales, increased their costs, and basically made their employees more miserable because they got to deal with like weirdos and awkward like, oh, show me your medical records. Yeah. And most people don't seem to enjoy the whole thing yeah um and so basically it's clearly bad for the businesses yeah. obviously because maybe in uh the ivory tower of the bureaucracy they don't realize like kind of the operational realities on the ground but it makes everything more expensive and less effective and then it's reducing your sales as well so it's all around loser but interestingly so the canadian federation of independent business this has been one of the groups who's been cheering for passports and rules and lockdowns because basically they've got the gun to their head. They're threatened with absolute destruction and it's, well, we shut you down um, or you have lots of crazy rules. And so in that choice, it's a terrible choice, yeah. but obviously it's an offer you can't refuse. It's like the mafia threatening to burn you down if you don't fork over some money. Yeah and let guys eat at your restaurant every night. But it's obviously making society poorer right now, just in terms of the immediate expenses. So then you pile on what you said, the, the future investment, it, that's not happening because things are happening so quickly. The government is so out of control. Uh, it's been two years of this insanity, just devouring people's capital, piling debts on them. And... It's going to make us so much poorer many years into the future as well. Like we are only starting to see the wreckage of this on our economy. A 6% inflation. Yeah. That it, I'm, <clears throat> I shudder to think, but I think it's just the beginning. Three, 334 billion was our, uh, was our deficit. Um, yeah, it was pretty much all printed brand new by the central bank. Freeland, uh, and then just given out to businesses yeah. for their wage expenses. Yeah. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands a month. Like if you make, uh, you know, say $5 million a year as a company, yeah. like huge amounts of money for late wage expenses. And that itself was what perpetuated it because if they weren't paying for people to be on lockdown, all of this would have ended a lot longer ago, but you can pay for idleness uh, or you can have as much idleness or shutdowns that you're willing to pay for really. Yeah. Otherwise it'd be like, hell no. 
No, Freeland trotted that out, and she was, it was like a cat bringing home a dead mouse. She was like, all of our GDP is back to where it was pre-pandemic, and all those jobs are back, and can't, like, Canada's awesome. And I I don't think you can, like, if you look at the, like, just, just the Look sh- how much money the government spent, and so if it's back to normal, think of all the private product lost. No. Yeah. Um, because you're basically just adding all that together. So the government share is making up for the loss of the private share, you, even though everything the government has spent has either been created out of thin air or, uh, you know, siphoned off from some other part of the economy. It's also completely obliterated the time preference of the average person. Because the future, yeah, prob- the future well, is yeah, too that's uncertain. what you're talking about with the with businesses, but I'm talking about like private stuff. Like, oh yeah, everybody. It's it's not even putting capital to work. It's the fact that whatever money you have sitting around that you can't spend on a vacation, or you can't, you know, you you updated your home office last year because the government kicked in a little bit of money, and the company you work for kicked in a little bit of money. But what else are you going to spend your cash on? Nothing. You're going to go buy shit no, coins like a it's fucking. Bad boomer so this broader kind of more macro econ level and of course i mean right down to the personal level but is that a segue into the uh federal aspect because there has been a federal election since our last conversation there has but are we done talking about alberta because that's big no hang on okay well this will tie in maybe federally in a sense but we also on the same day as the stupid municipal election we oh, had yeah. the we had the referendum you know for what? equalization. I've never so, seen a more impotent fucking use of it's like you had a, a ten inch dildo and he was just like flapping it around. He wasn't pointing it at anybody, he didn't threaten to ream anybody. He was like Albertan spoke loud and clear. And the Laurentian elite unleashed their hounds in, in newspapers and everything else. The which, Quebec premier dug up like an old Confederacy thing. They're like, we, we bought you. Yeah. And that's actually the perfect response, in my opinion, from the aspect of uh, realizing that, you know, you need a divorce here. No. Um, like, we own you. See, let's see the true colors of this. Yeah. You. We're, we're, we're their property and they like it that way. Yeah. They, we bought you and you should be grateful. I but, think that's okay, the other so thing. Okay. So that was good. That's part of it. And ba- Trudeau is basically like, yeah, you know, screw off. Like you guys are stupid. Put your bitch um, in. Same, same yeah. story so since So all forever. the perfect response. Now there seems to be some, you know, legislative process that it's going through, whatever. So, um, the problem is the oxygen is sucked out of every issue yeah because of all this virus shit so there's basically no momentum you're again like everything's so screwed up and happening so fast and time preference wise everything's disrupted you're just waiting to see like people were waiting today edge of their seat what are gonna be the rules for christmas jason kenny yeah i need to know he's like how many how many people gonna have i'd like to tell you but my boss summoned me so he yep, did so, delayed it till the next day because Justin had to have his way with them first. You know, I wanted to see it. I wanted to know what rules I would need to know so I can violate yeah. them. Hypothetically, if, I would never endorse violating rules. But if I was going to, I would want to watch it to find out what the new rules were. Being so that I didn't law. accidentally follow one by accident. Hypothetically. Yeah. I don't know. I think... Uh, yeah, or like done he, provincially, they're fucked. No, the, he just he had he had a, a ticket and no one fucking cared, and he's just like, well, I'll just file this away. This will be leverage, and it's like, I think it would have been like eighty percent if they had if they had actually done the question correctly. Um, well, I, honestly, I think it's fine. Like, if you think about it, like sixty, oh, well, it doesn't sound like that much. Why isn't it eighty or ninety? But you got to think about it. It's like. 50 or 60 percent more than the other side so it's like you've got the big piece but this is also the same ticket that you know our mayor was elected under do you know what i'm saying like enough people came out to support nancy 2.0 and also vote that the federal government well that's what people were saying oh they split the vote between 
Farkas and Smith and Davidson, and it's like she <sighs> cleaned up. She won every ward. Yeah. So she got the highest number of votes in every single ward. And for some reason, it's just, it's it's an urban thing. Right now, there's a way bigger divide, like, in Alberta between urban and rural than there is between, like, UCP and NDP. True. It's, it's like, just the cultural divide is uh, seems to be kind of getting farther apart very fast. Um, but the cities are very, you know left liberal prog do you or they think they are or whatever like people seem to love their their bridges and their public art like people come out and defend this public art crap like imagine being these people it's trash this it's ridiculous it's just a new version of people shitting on the uh uh on on like the farmers you know socialist party it Albertans don't want to be seen as dirt farmers. They want to see be seen as metropolitan. And part of being metropolitan. Well, who are these Albertans? It's only the urbanites. Yeah, but are they? But they're Albertans. Uh, most of them are Canadians. Yeah, Canadians. That's not the same. Well, I'm. I I moved here a long time ago. Hey, you know what? You know and how I live there was the something recently about that. It was some stupid survey about like, um, oh, would you want to live in this province? What do you think of this province? And and the headline on CBC or whatever was, um, did you see this? Do you know what I'm talking no, about? No. So it was uh, most Canadians don't want to live in Alberta. And I was like, good, good. <laughs> That's good. But you know what else that means? That means there is a difference yeah. that means there is a distinction so sure maybe in ontario uh you really care about xyz and alberta's priorities are slightly different normally that'd be real diversity if you will that would be um you know different um kind of ways of going about things like different just kind of social textures or social fabrics and that should be okay but Well, I don't know. You should look up what I'm talking about. It's, yeah. uh, it was pretty interesting. So uh, one thing that happened. But yeah, too many Canadians here. <laughs> there is quite a, well, I don't know. I, I think the lo a lot of the fair weather Albertans have decided to flee back to the uh, coasts. I don't think it was but, ever a target for, for that. No, but, but you know, you've met them. Yeah. You've met both kinds. Some people come here and they're like, I love it here. It's different here. It's awesome here. Yeah. Other people come here and they're like, it's different here. I don't like it. Um, everyone works too hard. Everyone's uh, racist. Or everyone's weird. Or like, who cares? The cowboys, these honkies. Yeah. I don't know. But some people don't like it. But that means it is different. And, you know, some people kind of blend into that social fabric differently and i think that's interesting because there's been some talk in recent years about like well is alberta a distinct culture and it's been very hard to yeah. define um that's that more or less meaningless uh, buffalo declaration remember that yeah um they said like oh a distinct culture but it's been there, hard to hard to put a grasp on the meaning of that but there is but there is a general sense because it's almost like the air it's like the the fish in the fishbowl. He's like, he doesn't know what the water is. Yeah. Uh, we don't know what the culture is because we're too in it. We've agreed there that there is something to it. Albertans are a people for sure. So anyway, that's why there needs to be a divorce. I, I don't, I don't know. He's uh, a he's, national divorce. Kenny. Well, the problem is still that Kenny is the worst fucking divorce lawyer that we could ever get. Oh God. Yeah. So do you think, I'll just bring this up maybe, and then we can switch to the federal stuff. Because again, there was a federal election too. Yeah. Like all this crazy stuff has happened. Yeah. Um, every day is insane these days. It's yeah. too much. So do you think that, because even Notley was saying, I also want a fair deal. I would just do it differently. Um, so okay. do you think she would be better like if that was in her hands the because you, you know what i would do if i was her i'd be like you know what justin 
because she'll probably be in charge next. Well, in charge, whatever that means. She'll be running Alberta. Yeah. I would just be like, hey, Justin, let's work something out and both declare victory. I'll be like, look, Alberta, I got you a better deal from Ottawa. Yeah. And Ottawa and Trudeau can be like, I built a more inclusive and fair Canada. He can't do it. And she won't, he, he won't be able to offer her anything to bring home. Like there's nothing to spin there. It's not going to be good enough. He cannot blink. He has spent his entire political capital in the Western provinces saying no, never fuck you. I'm not gonna don't care. Tell it like, what are you going to do? You're stop complaining. You're spoiled. Shut the fuck up. Well, that's because he can't get seats here. But if he had a bunch of seats here, it would change his tune, of course. Maybe. Uh, it depends but, on two things. I still owe you a steak dinner over this because well, I, I don't even keep track of that. Anymore. I still no. We, we that was like two years ago. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't paid. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm that a, was the 2019 election. Yeah. Yeah. I thought she was going to win because. She pulled the great Albertan uh, move of acquiescing to the oil companies. She spent millions of dollars uh, and gave it to Husky and and all the majors. Well, no one cared about that. Like no one even understood what any of that was. They just thought, oh, carbon tax, and that's no, what no, it she, was. She gave them money. They and the royalty stuff. She backed off. Well, that's off. why they were all lined up with her on the stage when she made the big announcement. Yeah. So everybody. Yeah. She had a bunch of guys out there and fucking all the uh, big oil companies. Yeah. So two or three of which are now gone from the province. By the way. Yeah. They took the money and ran. But it like, basically, it's just like the whole thing has been a way to move money into CRNRL's mitts. Yeah. So it, it told but, me that she understood where where the fucking you know, where, oh, yeah. where the sausage was made, but it all depends on whether she learned her fucking lesson, which is never, ever aligned yourself with the federal government in Alberta ever, period. You'll lose no matter what you do. If I see photos of you smiling with Justin Trudeau, you're gone. I don't know. Maybe in some parts, but in, in in the places where they like Jody Gondek, it might be a different story. Like Justin Trudeau, believe it or not, it's not super popular here. Um, but, but there are people who like Justin Trudeau and I, they like Rachel Notley. Be like, Oh, isn't it nice how they're uh, cooperating? Anyway, those people aren't really good. Sort um, of, but like, again, uh, I, I think that's what but cost I, her the election. I, I think that, no, I, I, I definitely disagree with that. I think she was just toast on the economic level. And of course, any cooperation mm -hmm. with Ottawa isn't good. And there was seen to be um, like a collusion. Like she gave up one big pipeline, which was uh, the, the what Petronasa mixed up or Northwest Gateway. Trans, I don't uh, know. Yeah, the one that was canceled. So we got line three. Yeah. We got Trans Mountain. The feds rolled in, bought up um, that one, yeah. And Northern Gateway got killed. Yeah. So I, like, you know, and then Energy East got killed. It was basically just all blamed on Notley's, like, stupid um, economics. Like, the economic reality killed her, basically. So, and of course, and Jason Kenny always said, oh, her friend and ally, Justin Trudeau, like it was always associated that way. Yeah, so I'm saying. So that is good. But that's what I'm saying for her from a political standpoint. I mean, if I was her. Can she love Or if I was advising her, say I was just some asshole and if she paid me money, like what would you do? Uh, like a good faith yeah. argument, like what should you do to like just purely uh, get more political first power. order of business I'd is say anybody make a deal with Ottawa yeah. and get the fair deal and un undercut the right from the right in a way on the uh, fair deal issue and That's be a good like plan. they didn't do anything yeah they didn't get you anything we yeah. did yeah and even if it's a bullshit deal like I think it would go over well enough because honestly I think Kenny would get a big bullshit deal too and then they'd all declare victory, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And everybody wins, everybody goes home. Yeah, but it'll be bullshit. Yeah. But the thing is, we need, you know, it's it's not something that happens in a year. It'll take many decades 
many different objective conditions to move the process forward. Uh huh. And um, when when different changes in people's ideas uh, as when, well. When uh, yeah, when the kids are grown up and go to college, maybe uh, maybe maybe my husband will stop beating the shit out of me. Uh, but until then, I have to protect them. You know, Alberta has beaten wife syndrome. Uh, well, yes, yes, but it's sticking with the analogy. You still need the divorce. Yeah. But it's just like, I mean, it's just reality. Like, I think she's, she's, so what do you do? You gotta, you gotta go with it as it comes along. I don't know. I, I think you need to throw a couple votes towards a separatist party. Well, I, yeah, I think there uh, needs to be some more of that. Um, the right in Alberta is going to be very potentially fractured and disoriented yeah. going forward if uh, there's a big UCP issue, which it looks like there's going to be in some way. Uh, like was, they're going to get just annihilated in the next election. I don't know who their savior is, and it's not Brian Jean. Um, no, Brian Jean, um, there was, he's uh, no good. He's basically Notley. Somebody said that the... Uh, he, he says... The he made comments like the UCP is too like extreme, like <sighs> extreme right. We can't we can't have extreme right and extreme left. He's one of these like magical middle guys. This oh. magical middle that if we just strike the perfect balance that it's, makes it, everyone love each other. It's it goes to my opinion, which is the only reason why somebody makes a right wing breakaway party is because they can't win the seats in the primary right wing party. Uh yeah, probably in some places. Yeah, they're like, well, but I can't beat the, I can't beat the cons. I'll start a party. We'll get seats that's, and then they'll have I'll, to buy me out. That'll uh that'll probably be getting like too far ahead because we've still got a lot of developments between now and the next uh whole Alberta provincial election yeah. and fracturing of the right again and all that'll be very interesting but i think it, we've covered the right issue so we had a referendum yeah. about brian jean going for kenny's job yeah uh, as as rachel notley part two dude i think the male version of rachel notley part two because yeah. kenny has been trying to be the male version of Fre rachel notley he's one. got the he's got the hips for it but he wound sure. up a little more like allison redford <laughs> too <laughs> Sky Palace. Male version. The Sky Palace comes back Sky to haunt. Sky Palace them. comes back to haunt you. Yeah. Um, but so so there's that. We have the municipal thing. Yeah. The virus thing is a total disaster here. Yeah. Uh, it's totally insane. Um, but then there was also a federal election in which nothing changed. Yeah. Like we still have basically the same I think there was setup as before. There was a bit of shuffling. Four seats total shuffled. Millions of dollars. The conservatives are basically campaigning for Trudeau, so they lose again. Yeah. Um, Trudeau didn't pick up anything. I I was kind of surprised. Yeah. I thought people were going to be like, we, because I have lost a lot of faith in Canadians. They love this lockdown stuff. There was that, okay, so there's two great things. One, he had pebbles thrown at him, like it was a political violence. These, these white supremacists and yeah. anti-vaxxers yeah. and so he got to go around in his fucking bomber jacket in his varsity jacket and talk about how the unvaccinated don't have the right to exist uh and but there was the greatest moment of the whole election was when that fucking like 18 year old fucking zoomer oh yeah took the, took the selfie. selfie with him and called him a fucking commie it was perfect i don't know if you're out there but Keep. I like, saw it. Please, for the love of God, keep doing what you're doing. That was pretty funny. Yeah, that was a legendary moment. Yeah. Uh. Well. Yeah. So I mean, he won. Uh. He. It all. It doesn't really matter. Like what happened. Like what it, all the little things that happened, they don't matter. In his what words, matters is that his a, opposition was utterly pathetic. Do you think Jagmeet is a little under the weather because it's been four months and he hasn't called? Canada or Canadians racist. Oh, he probably has. We probably just missed it. He's just like in his the other thing that I don't understand about Curtis, He probably said that when they closed borders on like some African countries over oh maybe. 
cross. Yeah, he's like, this is racist. Like no, he didn't even. He didn't he even. He probably did. Are you sure? I'm ninety nine percent sure he, he thought it was did. great. Or better yet, it doesn't matter because it's not like he was consulted. So we we need to we need to lock down more. Yeah, but we can't do it in a way that closes off the countries where we think the virus is. Yeah, just Europe and America, maybe. I don't even think they should have closed any borders don't be, ever during this whole thing. Don't be racist. They should have just let people like go. But I, anyway, they have so to the, be. So anyways, I think I, what I noticed up against Aaron O'Toole. So we got to talk about Aaron O'Toole. What a loser. On the one hand, Trudeau, I think is a better politician than some people give him credit for because he's just like, he's a demagogue. He's the, he's the, weirdo corrupt limousine liberal douchebag version of trump basically yeah and trump himself if you think about it is a form of new york big city limousine liberal type yeah who's just a little more kind of like i guess you might say blue collar-ish in some ways um and now he switched parties every to the opposite party of whoever was in power he's done that consistently since the 80s yeah but he just uh he seemed a little more like, I don't know, for lack of a better term, lower class. Folksy. Yeah, maybe folksy. I don't That's know what the, the word. word is. That's I, the word. That folksy. Could be. But you know what I mean, right? Yep. So Trudeau is basically just the opposite version of him. And that, and I think it goes over really well in Canada. And I think he knows how to milk it really well. Like just the words he uses, the way he talks, just the way he does things. I think he's uh, pretty smart or his team is or whatever. Now, Aaron O'Toole, we have to talk about because the Wait. big thing is that Trudeau, his main opposition is the most, like the biggest, most unbelievably pathetic leader and party opposition party like where is the opposition there hasn't been opposition in any way for like two years basically yeah and Aaron O'Toole is horrible I'll point out just a constant reminder that he is actually younger than Justin Trudeau <laughs> even though it doesn't he's not he, out there you he's had a hard life and uh so yeah so what do you think of Aaron O'Toole what are what do you think are his flaws in the sense of not only do we not like him at all in terms of, you know, policy, because we don't like the uh, the whole federal conservative party in general, not really our cup of tea, but as a politician. Well, he is unprincipled and inauthentic. Inauthentic. Trudeau seems authentic, or does yeah. he? No, he's it's, absolutely authentic. Do you think it's like the thing where... Um, they say like you're watching two different shows on the same screen, like people just see it that differently. Or do you think, um, because people might say Trudeau is a phony, uh, no, or an actor, yeah, he, but he comes across as quote unquote authentic. No, but that's who he is. Like, it, it's, I, I hate to mentally justify it, but like, he is who he portrays himself to be. You know what I mean? No, I don't think that's true. I think it's still a performance, but I think it comes across as it is who he really is. He's a method actor. He's like Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah, like he's once, an actor. He's a performer. Yeah, he might be the greatest of our generation, but like he and he's he, smug. He, he embodies Canadian smugness true. to a T. Yeah. And I think a lot of people really enjoy that kind of thing. I I think they like to see the personification of their own self satisfaction. But on the other hand, I shouldn't overstate that because a lot of people, like, he's not really hugely popular in the country or anything. He's not even really well-liked in general. Yeah. He has a pretty low, like, favorability. And uh, in terms of what the liberal government won with in terms of votes and seats and stuff, it wasn't very good. Like, it's not a huge ringing endorsement or anything. Um, but that's the thing. It comes back to look at his opposition. Yeah. So here's here's Aaron a, O'Toole here's, and the CPC are the worst. Here's a perfect example. So the House of Commons finally gets rolling. The Liberals are all upset because they can they they kicked it back to some Judiciary Committee that rules the House the the House Rules Group 
about not letting in elected officials because they won't disclose whether they're vaccinated or not. And the conservatives waffle about it back and forth. Eventually, the House committee says that's none of our fucking business. And we're not allowed to ask that. If you want to have a vote on it, go ahead. It's none of our business. It's not for us to dictate. But the conservatives get up there, uh, led by, uh, you know, Pierre. And uh, I think it was a new gal that got elected. I forget. But uh, they start grilling Trudeau about um, costs of things. They're like, you know, gasoline has tripled. uh, Food has doubled. uh, uh. Trudeau's such a a limousine liberal that he doesn't even know what a loaf of bread costs. How much does a loaf of bread or milk cost, Mr. Prime Minister? Like, I don't know how much that costs. I buy it all the time. I don't even look at the price. Did they literally ask that? Or was there a different question? That's what they asked. They said, does this Prime Minister know what a loaf of bread costs? And if he does, can he tell me, tell me, like, tell me what it is? But no, no, no. Here's, here's the kicker. This is why it's beautiful. He stood up and he goes, the federal government understands how expensive and hard it is out there for every Canadian. That's why we passed a $10 a day daycare. Yeah. Yeah. And then he sat down. Brilliant. And then he sat down. Of course, it's all for theater. Like they get to put it on their Facebook page and the conservatives get to put their zinger of a question on their Facebook page and all the idiots clap. And like, wow, got him, really got him there. Yeah, and he and they like, think, whoa, wow, look, they showed he doesn't, look at his non-answer. He didn't uh, tell them how much a loaf of bread is. Yeah. Um, and then on the Trudeau side, they'll be like, wow. If you can't yeah, see how. Really getting, t- dealing with the issues instead of these distractions. Trudeau is amazing. Suck it, losers. Yeah, no, so, he, he uh, but like that is the quintessential question period for me. And uh he doesn't, if they asked him another question, he would just stand up and repeat that answer again. Okay. You know what it is? You know why, you know why I think there's no good opposition why? from the right in Canada at the political federal level in Cause, particular? Cause they, anybody that doesn't, but this goes, this, hang on, this goes, this mainly applies to the whole lockdown thing, but it goes to all the levels and it really kind of affects society at lots of levels, but I think the conservatives don't even know how to talk about the issue. So they don't know how to talk about, they can't be in opposition to lockdowns because everything is so um, material and democratic and it's all focused on like public health and uh, oh, keeping you healthy. That is the one priority that matters. There is no opposition in the sense of like, what is the trade-off for that? Conservatives don't have the vocabulary to discuss what they're sacrificing in exchange for this quote-unquote safety or having this risk taken off our hands. So what am I talking about? Like, um, you know, the the uh, people's social connections. Yeah. Like, the meaning of those is clearly being underrated. Um, the ability to see people's faces is basically something no one will try to defend. Um, and again, because it's all about public health, it's not, oh, well, you want somebody to get sick or you want to see someone's, uh, or you want people to be healthy or you want to see people's faces and the right Again, in particular, all these so-called opposition parties or even the parties in power, like so-called conservative parties in Canada, the politicians, there's no argument that they have because they've basically become so um, progressive themselves just at kind of the slower pace. It's like the joke, um, the conservatives... uh, what what do they say conservatives now it's like five years a liberal five years ago yeah 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 so the overton window so i don't know maybe it goes back to that kind of pessimism thing amongst conservatives i talked about earlier but uh or maybe i don't even know if we were recording when we were talking about that but yeah there's no opposition because they don't have the arguments they don't have any principle at all to go against this Um, inherently, in my opinion, uh, leftist and ideological and totalitarian public health system that we've created. The arguments against it, 
Um, there's a lot of intuition that a lot of people have, obviously, that it's wrong. But it's hard to explain in our current world, which is very, you might say, spiritually shallow or uh, a little uh, materially focused. We're only concerned about like our physical health, but we're giving up everything for that. And there's no understanding of the trade-offs. The conservatives can't make that argument. They can't argue that they're losing something more important than what these lockdowns are supposedly giving. And that's assuming they're effective, which they aren't even. So it should be an easier argument to make. But the point is, I think that's a big reason why the right is got nothing to bear against this kind of virus thing. Yeah. But especially at the federal level, because that's the dynamic. Well, I mean, I think you pointed out correctly that DeSantis did everything right. What he did is he brought out his own scientists, uh, well-respected, um, you know, just savages uh, who would sit out there and answer all questions and explain things as they were. And uh, it's a principled approach. It has nothing to do with, uh, like, he doesn't have to argue that uh, kids don't contract COVID at any particular rate. He doesn't even have to argue that literally 90% of people that died were either in uh, long-term care or a hospital or a uh, prison. He doesn't have to make these arguments. He simply walks out and says, I am not letting you put masks on these kids. The end. Right. So no one has the, no, they just lack principles. And they do that only because they identify themselves as the opposition to an ideal. Yeah, and you know, so much of it has been about, oh, uh, like every, you, you fall into the trap of uh, fighting the virus cult when it becomes about the public health issue. It's like, oh, is this an effective policy? Oh, is, is this an effective policy? Will this lead to more deaths or will this lead to more deaths? Yeah. And of course, rather than kind of a more, um, I guess, deontological or uh, um, sh more strict, I guess, uh, what you might say, principle-based um, approach where, you know, it's, um, yeah, somebody, people might die but not that it's worth it, but it's not worth the trade off. Um, it's like, uh, well, some people might die from the vaccination, but it's a small price to pay. Well, it's anything. It's literally anything. It's, we could get rid of all the car accidents. Obviously yeah. we could make it perfectly safe. We could make it, uh, no faster than 20 kilometers when you're in your car. Yeah. And even if there was a crash, it would be extremely minor. They want to do we that. We could do that. Yeah. They they want to do that in Calgary. Oh, well, yeah. Like, they want to slow it down in a bunch of neighborhoods. Yeah. I think they did. I think that's yeah. like a thing now. Um, maybe it's not. Now, every, now everywhere maybe. is like Mount Royal. Yeah. Safety, safety, safety. But everything can always be done more safely. So cars, again, that's uh, in, a, in Canada alone, that's thousands of people every year dying in cars because of crashes. You could eliminate all the crashes, but it's not worth it. And it's not a question of, well, this will uh, kill fewer people or more people. It's just um, there's a certain kind of boundary where life is intolerable because we aren't uh, assuming that risk in our, ourselves. And people have accepted this total socialization of risk on a scale pretty much unimaginable two years ago. Do you think that that's a byproduct of democracy? Yes, and whether democracy plays a role in the um, in the transfer of liability. It's not my fault I caught COVID. It's the government for letting unvaccinated people roam free. Yeah, it's just the tendency of socialization in general. Socialization in a sense of like socialism and democratic socialism is part of that category in in you know that broad sense if you're thinking about it that way um and especially in the deal with public health like insurance health is is basically about insurance right it's about protecting yourself from kind of a catastrophic catastrophic thing that you can't just like deal with so right. the idea is like you need an emergency operation or whatever 
um, or you get sick and you need medicine, like, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but the idea behind it is, uh, like when you put everyone together, there's, it's not insurance anymore. It's because you're not pooling the risks differently. Cause no one wants to be, you can't predict if you're going to be the winner or the loser in insurance. Yeah. Um, in terms of like getting more payout than what you get. But what you can do is uh, you can pool the risks differently. So I wouldn't want to be in a insurance pool with, uh, say, the crackheads or the the promiscuous people or the drug addicts the or Danish whatever. minister of health or the smokers or the overeaters or the motorcycle drivers, you know, whatever. It's like, you're trying to break up the categories so you can, um, judge them differently. But when everyone's in the same group for like a public health purpose, uh, it's not really insurance anymore. Like everything is the same. Well, yeah, uh, we there's should, there's no difference in the risks. We should treat an 18 year old exactly the same as we treat a 90 year old from a public health policy because you can't just lock down 90 year olds. Well, yeah. And that's, uh, I think it was the Simon Fraser, uh, paper from a while back that the guy put out and, uh, it was an economist and the way he looked at it was, um, and I think they do this in insurance in some respects, but it was, uh, you know, judging years of life basically. Yeah. So putting in slapping an economic value on it and, uh, you know, it sounds a little, crass or whatever but there's a number uh, it's insurance insur it's just like insurance, it's, it's kind of like, how they calculate certain things this is not like, like three, anyway 375 or something like that uh it's yeah not a so lot. it's not like a philosophical no thing there's a like, hard oh, life number. is uh, worth this much but so uh what was i saying the um fraser simon fraser institute yeah, so not Simon Fraser institute the university so some economic professor he's calculating it by uh you know years traded off and uh, I'm not saying I've subjected this to uh, rigorous, rigorous scrutiny, yeah. but he basically said like, yeah, you're taking off like years of life from young people yeah. and you're adding like basically nothing to old people. So purely on kind of a uh, utilitarian sense, greater um, good, the way he shows it. You get nothing for one group and you make another group worse off. So it's like, seems like a no brainer. Yeah. Um, but of course the lockdown people hate children. They absolutely <laughs> hate them. Remember when they everybody, want all their activities closed down. They want masks on their face at all times. These kids don't like, it's horrible. Yeah. And, um, you know, like, uh, all your activities make school a million times more miserable than it already is. Yeah. Um, be treated like a disease carrying uh, little rat because your teachers are terrified of you. Yeah. It's horrible. Well, you remember the way they lock them up, <sighs> make them eat, eat their lunches at lunch break by themselves, not allowed to talk to anyone. It's yeah, there's no reason not to homeschool your fucking kids at that point. Like they're like, well, I got to work. And it's like, well, this kid has to grow up and not be fucked. In well, the that's head. another thing with the right. And this is too much of a rabbit trail. We shouldn't even talk about it. I shouldn't even bring it up, but it's like the right, they, they complain about the schools and they keep sending the kids. Yeah. Um, and think of the, all this buzz about the Alberta curriculum now. Uh, oh my God, the curriculum. Yeah, and they made a like, big. Of course, the curriculum is going to be trash. Doesn't matter whether it's the Kenny government or the Notley government or some other government. Did, it's going to be trash. Did you? And these teachers unions who say, "Well, we should have an input in the curriculum." Why? Yeah. Why should the teachers have an input in the curriculum? I'm not saying they shouldn't, but why? Why is it just a default? What if the teachers, who obviously have a very strong political slant one way, why would we want them necessarily to have all this input why should they be the ones creating it the whole thing uh is ridiculous but of course that's another place that the right is totally impotent like no follow-through do you take did, your kids out of the schools did you see uh it was this summer uh there was a big to do because they found an old like coursework for sociology for high school where they 
uh, the questions were, um, you know, uh, what are some of the good and bad things about this government or that government? What are some good or bad things about Nazi Germany? And they're like, you can't say there was anything good about Nazi Germany. So, you know, that's weird. Right. Because that story was weird to me because I, it was the same in our high school, right? Like when we learned about communist Russia and Nazi Germany, it was always like, oh, well, their, you know, their economic systems had uh, the, all these wonderful features, but they just killed people. Yeah. And there's no connection, of course, between the idea of just the state as such having enough power to socialize the economy in that way, being bad and being the thing that leads to the killing of the people. Yeah. There's no connection. They think there's like, you can just have a huge. And then one day, and then one day for no reason at all. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember all that stuff like, wow, uh, uh, oh, Nazi Germany had these uh, good economic policies to get them out of the depression and they got out of the depression faster than America did. So wah, 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 but they were bad. Yeah. And it was the same thing with the commies. Like um, the textbooks were ba- and the teachers were basically, yeah, they killed a bunch of people, but look how amazing their economy was. Look at how many tractors and, they had. I mean, I remember that. And I yeah. thought of that when I saw that story and, um i yeah, thought because we talked uh, about that on the uh the last one actually they well i think that story was more yeah. recent than that no no but we had talked about your uh your encounter with the public education system of oh yeah uh, with yeah. the stalin essays yeah, yeah. okay but well, I, don't I, wonder... I found it interesting they're like oh my god we were so horrified that we immediately removed it and uh we have no idea how this got in here and they're like okay let's go get an interview from uh, the local Jewish, uh, hate, like the, the local ADL, uh, kind of branch. And they're like, Oh my God, I can't believe they would teach this. You can't think there's anything good about this. And it's like, well, well, yeah, the whole thing's crazy. Like, do you either way, do you want the freaking public school teachers teaching your kids anything about that? They're going to get all of it wrong. They're going to always have some agenda to grind. True. And, um, but like I'm, you can say there was nothing good, but like state your case. This is kind of the point, right? Well, it's like uh, people sometimes in the states they complain like, "Oh, there's no prayer in the public schools," and it's like, well, one yeah. of the reasons they took it out is because some religious people didn't want other religious people. Yeah. Like, I don't want them teaching my kid how to read the Bible. Yeah. And so, some of that is easily applicable to the same situation, like. You don't want the government teaching your kids stupid stuff about history and economics. What what do you expect? Yeah. Like you're not you're not going to get the curriculum the way you want. It's going to be bullshit no matter what. So the um people just like to complain. I I I don't know, fuck the teachers. I I'm so glad so many people are pulling out their fucking kids out of school. So one yeah, thing that terrible. we that we lost uh, from the 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 failed recording was uh, um, the this idea that I think is pretty important for people to uh, talk about with anyone else when it comes to things like vaccines, and it is to try and determine people's line in the sand. Where is your line? Yeah. So, like, for some people, their line was the mask. They're like, fuck you. No way. Or maybe it's the booster. Yeah. A lot of people's lines are the booster. Yeah, a lot of people seem to... Seems well, seems to be the line. Some, some But people, when they turn off their passport, they're, they'll probably just get the booster. So, the... Aw, shucks. What led me... The, the other part of that is... This time, you'll lift the lockdowns, right? <laughs> it'll go back to normal if i get the booster right right so you you'll you'll stop running everything as an emergency kind of thing right you, we'll have a regular representative democracy again right i won't have to quarantine i won't have to make get tests i won't have to wear masks no you'll still have to do all of that yeah, you you won't literally put me in a camp when i come back to my country no you'll still have to do that oh 
But for how long though? You know, like it, it. So like as long as it takes. Yeah, I. It's so funny for that safety. The, yeah, the va- the the politicians that are uh, extremely pro vax, especially in Australia, they have the most conviction I've ever seen a politician have. They're like, I don't give a fuck if you're in the middle it's of the a cult, desert. man. They're preachers. It's it's so. It is a cult. It's I keep saying this refreshing. But it's, it's easy to understand. So the other part is uh, what I struggled with, and I, I think we talked about, was uh, anti-vax as an identity. So because things have been so uh, polarized, unfortunately, and, and I've fallen into it, I think we all have, uh, if you're unvaccinated, uh, making uh, a lack of vaccination be your fucking identity so that there's zero way you can get out of it without effectively just destroying yourself. Well, it's not, it's not that that's part of your identity other than the fact that people keep calling people that. And like, it's this, a a group that's been set aside, but I think, um, but they, I I think it's deeper than that. What you're saying is right, but it's, it's another level from that because they're anti-vax because of a principle. The principle isn't anti-vax because a lot of them apparently, or so it seems a lot of them will just say like, ah, vaccines are cool, you know, but I'm not into the the coercion and I'm not saying that's necessarily a huge group or a huge share of it, but it seems to be that a lot of people, um, do have the issue there where there's some like bodily integrity thing or like some medical coercion thing, you know, the way they see it. Yeah. Um, whether right or wrong, like that's kind of the perception. So it's, it's the expression of that. So it's not the anti-vax identity. It's this other deeper, um, you know, for say some people, they might be like the property rights in your body or your self ownership or the, my body, your choice, you might sum it up as, um, and, People can be pretty sensitive about uh, the issue. And then that's something that feels very under threat if you cave for some external influence. Do you think that they're um, that that forward thinking? They're like, if I don't draw my line here, if you want to put that in my body, that eventually means this. Well, for some people, but they might not have, they might not be thinking about it explicitly. It might be like an intuition that's just operating like in their blood, basically. Okay. It's like the political, maybe you're born certain ways um, and you don't necessarily have a reason for your orientation on a lot of issues or, um, you know, I think Jonathan Haidt does a lot of the stuff on that, like breaking up the categories. Uh, um and I think there's probably some argument that people do just kind of have it in them in a way that they can't really articulate. Okay. But- um, because if you see vaccine, like kind of coercive vaccination as unethical, uh, and it's not the kind of unethical you can undo. It's not like if you're unethical in a way where you say, uh, defraud someone or, um, you know, uh, betray a trust or, or something like that. You can make amends. You can, you can kind of make someone whole from that kind of stuff. You can't be unvaccinated. You you just, it's a seatbelt. You can't ever take off. You know, it, it can't be undone. And so if you, if you see it as unethical, it's like presenting to these people, you must do something that is irrevocably unethical and it, it's impossible to 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 walk back that line that's that's the position that i maybe i've overthought it but no, i the anti-vax is a major line and i i can see why it's uh it's the body if you own anything in this world it's the meat packing your bones. And for me, it it's like beyond the arguments like, whoa, oh, is it is it good or bad? Like, uh, it's 
once you once you basically threaten me like i'm not engaged anymore yeah like i don't work that way you can try to persuade me but you don't get to um basically expropriate or um interfere or aggress against me or interfere with my other cooperative relationships and exchanges with people just because I won't take your medicine. Are you? And if, well, for people to, uh, for that to be the proposition, like you can get uh, this back that we took from you if you uh, take our medicine. And it's like, no, it, that's not like a discussion because it's so far over the line at that point. It and just, it, it made me think of it. Because this. it brushes right up against the biggest boundary. Like it's your physical body. Yeah. Like well, it's, it's the line between you and the outside world in a sort of sense. Well, I kind of thought about it in a joking way, but now it, it, it kind of, it follows. Uh, Cause remember when all of a sudden all those flights got delayed over the course of a week and they're like, oh, it's, it's a weather pattern. And like, everyone's yep. like, they're, what are you talking about? It's clear skies has been for an entire couple of days. And it kind of made me think they're like, well, if they can force pilots to take a vaccine, why can't they just force them to fly? Well, because the force, they that's why they say it's not force at all. We're just taking your job away yeah. from you. But, but they, you can't chain the guy to the plane like you're flying. Well, can't you? If you can, if well, you yeah, can, you can. If you can, if you you can f- it's physically possible. If you can coerce him to the point of having to take uh, a, and put something in his body he doesn't want, um, you know, because you're not coercing him, you're not strapping him down to do it. You're just taking things away from him. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's totally different. And I, and that's why they make this ridiculous argument that it's like, oh, it's all voluntary. Yeah. There's no man. Like, there's this thing they keep saying, um, there, uh, there's no mandatory vaccines. I'm against mandatory vaccines. That was the big Brian Gene thing. He's like, people have been asking for my opinion on this. Well, here's my brave opinion. I'm against mandatory vaccines. Well, everyone's against mandatory vaccines, but that's because they've defined mandatory in basically in- a way we will like strap you down or we will fine you or whatever. Yeah. Here, it's not mandatory but will hurt you basically until you do it yeah uh will just hurt you a little passive aggressively well i it's it's a joke kind of way of looking at it but um if they have say over your body um you know they kind of have say over what you do with your body you know so it, 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 oh yeah, it's a line that's dangerous to cross. I think of a lot of people, they don't, you know, they might not use the slippery slope kind of argument, but I think kind of what you were saying before, they sent that it's, they sense that it's just a dangerous line to cross. And once you compromise one level, it's always easier to go to the next level or it's always easier to, you know, compromise again. And it's, it's like what Jack Bauer said in episode one, yeah. season one what, of what, 24. What did he say? I don't know. Or was it episode two? He says something like, uh, they weren't bad people. They just compromised. And every time you compromise, it gets easier to compromise. And that's <laughs> when blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Because remember, they were hating on him because he busted some dirty agents or something yeah. kind of in the the pre-show background storyline. Anyway, that was a good show. Yeah. Any- <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big line. And people know that crossing it is major there's there's just like a symbolic quality to it to um uh penetrating one's flesh in this kind of coercive manipulative way or um that's why in a sense like taking especially if some people are scared of it like some people are really quite apprehensive even though the risk might be relatively low or whatever overall like I'm I'm scared of it. I don't uh they don't want to have some crazy reaction and that's that's like basically a threat of violence almost. Yeah. Um because it's like threatening people to attack them or uh, punch them in a way. Yeah. 
Um, well, they'll they'll have a panic like attack. Like you're saying, and you're saying I need to be like punched in the face to yeah. get my job, or like it's um, it does have like a, a violent aspect, and it's I don't know, it's like not a blade, but it's it's like a spear. It's like piercing into you, and it's injecting um, a foreign substance, like death into you in yeah. a way. It's like it's injecting the power of death to protect you from uh, the power of death. Yeah. The, and it's just a weird. The Weinstein meme. Uh, or, yeah. The, the, Classic. Uh, yeah. It fits. It fits. It's just a jab. No big deal. It is. It's invasive. It's it's penetrative. It's predatory. It's uh, it does. It, it goes beyond other things. You, so no wonder people are giving up jobs of like 30 years to not get it. No wonder people are uh, tolerating like their families being torn apart over just total derangement. Um, and it's funny, like uh, I saw the uh, one thing I saw was uh, because the people who are vaxxed don't seem to have a lot of confidence in their vaccine because a lot of them are like terrified of the unvaccinated. Yeah. And so you think, well, I don't want to get the, <laughs> if I get the vaccine, like, am I going to be like really afraid of all these people? Like, maybe I don't want to deal with the deal with the pressure i the stress i or think the it's fear it's just swapping. i don't want to live in fear man it's swapping one i currently live in fear of having to have these fucking conversations like because because you're never gonna you're never gonna check people to the point where they're satisfied do you know what i mean if they're virus cultists just yeah. make fun of them like but like I, I don't know. I, I just don't think I could work in an office with people that take that seriously. Oh, like, no, it'd look, be unbearable. There's some common sense shit that you can do, but there's a temporal aspect to this that is unavoidable uh, if you're going to be in an office. There's just no way around it. Uh, the end. You know? Like, if you... Oh. So, the, the question is, who's left to lead in Canada? So, we had... We had... Uh, Bernier survived his leadership review with 95% of the vote. That, well, I guess technically he did a good job. He like uh, went from zero to fucking 10%. Yeah, went still from like no one seats. to 5%. Still no seats. Oh, but now do they get bennies from Ottawa? Uh, no. Because they crossed 5%. I think they get some bennies. No, I think, I they, think they get some funds. They shut that they down. they get a subsidy. They no, I think they get it. Oh, no, they shut that down. Just because of them. Uh, no, because of the green, well, we ain't the, green it. the green party, well, the green party's toast. Yeah. Uh, do you, uh, and you know what? I think the green party's full of anti-vaxxers. Yeah. Like granola vegan types. Fuck. Yeah. They're, I know a lot of granola type vegans who have been quite surprising and they've kind of pivoted. Um, I, it's just in kind of my personal sphere. I know some of these people and basically all of them have switched to uh, like, like a different kind of thing. It's, yeah. it's like maybe they weren't cause they were kind of like classic hippies, I guess. And so there's kind of an authoritarian leftism that maybe they got caught up in yeah. because of other issues, but they've uh, pulled back Th this whole lockdown stuff has really divided who's legit and who's not no. when it comes to, uh, I'd say, what's good for society yeah. and your passion for freedom. Here's my biggest question that I've noticed. Why uh, why do Antifa groups in America and in Europe not latch on to this? Like forced vaccinations. Why don't they use that as a political fulcrum to bring in people to the fold? You've got people's lives have been ruined because they don't want the government dictating what they do or don't put in their body. Now, if you're uh, a, a good, uh, you know, liberal sort, uh, you think, you know, look, the government has no business telling me what I put in my body, be it crack cocaine or vitamin D. Um, I'm shocked that if, if your anti-fascist state 
why you would perceive government mandates that people have to take this shot or lose their job or or, or any number of of additional problems like they were like you know new brunswick passed that law where they're like yeah if you want to if you sell groceries and you want to well, there's been a lot of leftists who have talk, spoken out about against that. I uh, haven't like um, only from the only from the lens of race. No, I haven't seen. I mean, that's often an angle that they bring into everything. But I've seen a lot of that. Like, uh, I don't know, like a prominent one is uh, like freaking Jimmy Dore or something, or like Max Blumenthal or uh, Dore was so close to being based. No, but they they are against a lot of that. Uh, uh, lockdown and mandate stuff, which is good. There yeah. is that element on the left. But when you say, like, why aren't they uh, embracing that? Well, it's because of the culture war aspect. There's been, for the most part, a relatively clear split uh, left and right uh, in terms of opposition and favorability towards the whole lockdown thing. So when scumbags have something to beat their opponent with it's not about principle it's like i will use whatever i can to beat these people up so people like antifa hate uh certain people on the right more than they value you know like you know basic dignity of people to not <laughs> have to have a medical passport to go to restaurants or keep jobs and stuff yeah and so think about the caricature of the lockdown supporter or pardon me, the lockdown opponent and the quote unquote anti-vaxxer. Yeah. Um, it's basically, you know, redneck, stupid people, um, uneducated people, people who don't know how to read people who don't know how to trust the science. So dumb, religious people, dumb, like just dumb, retarded, moronic Trump supporting, uh, redneck hillbilly dummies. So 66% um, of the black population in New York. Well, a lot of them don't like get that at all. Like they think again, they characterize the so-called anti-masker, the anti-vaxxer as a Floridian basically white man? a, you know, the tea party Trump voter hillbilly redneck type. They don't associate. That's why that whole thing breaks down when you actually look at it. They're like, Oh, it's all, so you look at the states and you're like, oh, it's all uh, red states. Trump supporting states have the worst uh, or the clearest distinction on like lockdown support or, or sorry, anti-vaxxing. Yeah. Um, but no, once you zoom in, it breaks down in a very different way. And it, there's a lot of um, it's kind of across the spread for the anti-vax type. But they because, again, like you say, in New York, it's two thirds of the blacks. It's. Uh, a large percentage of other minorities as well. It's mostly white people who love the vax to death. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's there's basically that whole issue with being able to beat up on the worst people in the world, which is these white supremacist, Trump voting Nazi characters, characters that they've created in their heads is much more valuable than defending anything principled on the left that would coincide with kind of an anti-lockdown or a sane sort of public health position that doesn't cut off massive racial groups, doesn't strip uh, lower income people of jobs because they don't get the vaccine or whatever. Like the whole thing's crazy. And, and, and again, people like Antifa, it's not like full of black people. It's <laughs> white douchey college kids so, who are and and mentally insane people. Like I don't know if you follow some of the things where they track the arrests. I follow Andy Nolan. Andy Nolan. Yeah. arrests. Yeah. So like these people are not. They're not sending their best. <laughs> <laughs> Although there was that one. So, there there was they did have a super based guy who uh, said I'm not going alive, and uh, he didn't. So. The, the real question is, would this have been completely opposite if Donald Trump had won in the election? No, because Donald Trump was one of the worst lockdown tards of them all. He was one of the big lock. He, he no, thought no, no, no. Hear, genuinely, hear, hear we will out. like lock down the virus to death. Hear me out. We will make it go away by Easter. Operation Warp Speed. These are all Trump's vaccines. Uh... 
dude you you could see you can uh there's a great twitter account called just uh libs of tiktok or uh libs posting their l's or something like that and there was a lot of people who were just like i'd rather fucking die than take trump's vaccine and then yeah. six months later six months later go get the fucking vaccine you evil piece of shit it would have been very different i'm sure but not in canada because canada would have doubled down even harder on lockdowns you passports think? and vaccines you because that's so? what we do we do the opposite of the americans that is our populist nationalism anti-american leftoid ontario quebec style anti-american nationalism now we would have we we're downstream and we're the little cousin that got left behind and we would have eventually after the they'd be like look all the old people are vaccinated oh this is trump's vaccine uh i hate trump yada 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 and then you'd have a bunch of people on the right that are like it's your social duty we we would have a well, i don't know because trump sure loved the vaccine he's still telling he people fucking to get it. loved it and he was one of the biggest lockdown tards of all because he basically just let these bureaucrats take over with the plan they cooked up like a few months earlier for basically medieval policy on the whole thing. Totally insane. He was a joke. The McCullough interview on Rogan, uh, which came out this week, was really interesting uh, because he points out that it is crucial to this kind of approach that you cannot have a viable um, you can't have a viable treatment because that would invalidate the emergency youth uh, authorization. And everyone, you know, like they go like Pfizer made $330 billion last fucking quarter or well, it's for their years. So they, and it cost them no money to produce or, or like the government paid to make it and the government bought it all. Wow. What a system. And then they, anytime I see that, I just think of Martin Shkreli. Farmer bro, people hate that guy, and they're like, "Oh my god, he he's better than Elon Musk." <laughs> <laughs> well, they they fucking hate him. They're just like, "Oh my god, you piece of shit, you bought up this medicine and then charged a bunch more for it." And the and that's a conceptual thing. Like they're never gonna buy that thing, and they're they're like, "Oh, you're taking advantage of poor people." And it's like, "What the well, fuck yeah, do you think?" People can't. I think that's what I, I was kind of saying before. Like, there's. Uh, you can't really expect any kind of consistency because it's a it's a tool to beat someone with. So it's not about being consistent. It's about doing what you want, getting uh, your political ends through, uh, being able to be on the good side and tell the other side that they're stupid dummies. Like, am I stuck being a fucking like, am I cucked? Because I, I think consistency and principles are important. No, it's sellouts who are cucked. No, I think I think we're cucks. No, it's sellouts are the the suckers. Like we're we're old men screaming at clouds. It's like like you should do things that are principled and based on like you know reason. Yeah. Yeah. But no one fucking cares. A lady that's the thing you've you've set up the wrong standard like no one what do you mean no one a lady the people who don't care are scumbags and uh speaking of position of weakness like caring what these scumbags think <laughs> like oh they they uh they aren't impressed by your principles exactly of course they're not impressed by your principles I'm, i've been listening to the machiavellians uh uh, because Curtis Yarvin said, along with Democracy, the God that Failed, it's one of the most quintessential books he's ever read. Um, and it, it's pretty interesting. Um, but one thing that is, is shocking is that one thing that is crucial to all power is fraud. In what sense? Well, unless you're born into power or money... Uh, one of the most important things to get you there is fraud. Is lying. Is breaking your word. No new taxes. There'll never be a COVID passport. Well, yeah. Like, that's the upside down, twisted world of politics. Normally, uh, yeah, sometimes you can get away from with lying for a little while. But you, you don't really get away with anything in the private sector long term. Um, I mean... In politics, on the other hand, 
you're rewarded the better you lie. That's how you build your political capital. Yeah, like power power requires fraud. And your idiot can, supporters will defend you no matter what you say so, and how many times you break. So if fraud is crucial, if fraud is crucial to power, how can one have principles? Well, think about it because the um if you need so your question is if you need fraud for power how can you have principles yeah well that assumes power is the most important thing or something that you should be aspiring to because what is power well some people would say power is i mean political power is power to control other people power is authority uh, that's not a good thing that we should be striving for if anything we should be you know rebuking the powerful and um, taking their power away well, I I don't I think power is simply shorthand version for is shorthand for authority, right? Uh, you you could uh set them up that way, but in general, I would say they're not. I mean, I think that's actually a leftist position. That's an inherently anti hierarchical position. It's uh, an egalitarian position because it suggests that a hierarchy must be enforced with power like they're basically the same um whereas i think something based on uh i mean you can have kind of a tyrannical hierarchy of course but you can also have um what you might call like a legitimate authority based hierarchy i don't know like the like the hobbesian interpretation of it maybe so anyway, spell out your thoughts a little more because you asked uh, before, like, how do you... I don't think if, it's... If, if for power you need fraud and you're a principled guy who's not into the whole fraud scene, which I would hope anyone who's not a scumbag is, but of course politicians are the worst people. They are sociopaths by nature. That's wh why they're in there. It's a selection bias problem. But spell it out for me because you ask me. Yeah. Cause so what is your answer to that? I... I think, and as it relates specifically to um, libertarianism or even, you know, like a minarchy or just, just the elimination of the uh, power of the state, uh, I think, I, I think you have to be a fucking liar to run shit when it comes to a... Um, any kind of politics yeah it's road to serfdom it's hayek's thesis like shit floats the worst rise to the top that is the nature of the system where the biggest and best liar basically gets to the top of the hierarchy they're best at manipulating people they are the so, best at lying that's what Mencken said so why are right-wing people so shitty at lying uh that's interesting um I mean, I don't know if that's the case, but I mean, the questions. You know, I'm not saying provocative. It's, like, it's not the uh, only. Are key. they so bad at lying? Well, I mean, probably not. Or are they? I, I don't know if they are. So I don't know if I can accept the premise of the question and therefore answer it. So it's got to go back like a meta level or something. Do you, do you think uh, kind of liberal or progressive politics? hang their hat on the idea of consistency and integrity and principles? Uh, I think you have to answer that question again. It sounded complicated. Uh, okay, so is it, are, are progressives and liberals... Better at lying? No. Are they, do they consider themselves principled? Do they, do they... Oh yeah, probably. Okay, do they represent themselves as principled? I don't know. Some of them, I guess. Well, like, we, we got to... Like, what does that mean, principled? I mean, uh, I'm sure they got, think they do. Got to bring the light like, of I'm democracy. I'm a principled... Yeah. Uh, I'm a principled defender of the environment. Canadians need blah, blah, the blah. The middle class. Rah, rah, rah. So... Principles. Those are my principles. Yeah, so I... We need principles, not yeah. politics. Yeah. Everyone says that. Yeah. So... Why is it that people on the right, whom you would assume to be 
to to kind of stake out a you know monopoly on principled and ethical approaches to governance as opposed to a progressive flip the table over green new deal approach why is it that people on the on the right are so horrible at maintaining or like is it do they suck because they are being principled and not do you know no. what i mean no, I know what you mean. Uh, I think I think you dodged the question a little bit, but we'll go back to that. This is also interesting. So this relates to what I was saying before about lack of opposition. Like they're not bringing uh, any principle from which to form an opposition to the table. You know what I mean? They don't stand so, for anything. Exactly. What they are is it's like the the Malix quip or the malice quip. Uh they're just the progressives going the speed limit. <laughs> they they have their foot on the brake a little bit, but they have no argument against any of it. If they say we need to do this, the the right will say because all they've got is basically putting their heels like just stubbornness almost because they've got no other intellectual basis for what they've got. They just say, well, no, uh, you want this. We need this, but a little less. What do you think of Zam Moore's uh, um, PM announcement in France? But hang on, hang on. I want to finish the thought here for a second. The right here, so we're talking kind of more about Canada. I don't know. Yeah. Just, I guess, whatever context. But um, that lack of principle, it's, there's nothing. There's no, you know, vision or whatever that leaders project for the democratic masses to gobble up. Now, Trudeau, we might not agree with it, but he's got a quote unquote vision. Yeah. What is he about? He's about fairness and diversity and protecting the environment and um, affordability, like making your life better. It's all kind of hokey garbage, yeah. but it's, he's got it kind of packaged up in some uh, offering yeah. with no, basically his competition saying, yeah, that's pretty good, but can you tweak it a little bit? Yeah. So he's, He's the center of um, kind of the political reality, uh, not just because he's in charge, but because like he sets the pace. Yeah, it's all around him. There's no contrary vision. You've basically got the CPC is the NDP just slightly on the other side. It's the NDP. Like, what is the difference exactly? They just want a little more, and the CPC just wants a little more, but kind of like this instead. Then why don't you think that the People's Party just absolutely, like, didn't just absolutely dominate that election? The four pillars. He just hit them every the, time he was in front of a uh, a camera. He hit those four pillars. He's like, "Here's my package. Here's my here's my principles. Here's my ideals." I I don't know. I don't know the answer there. I'm not sure. If like federal politics is the best way to go. Um, and I think there's just a lot of inertia in the system. Like most of the conservative party members. So like hardcore voters, they're really quite old. Yeah. It's like a very old group and the type of people who would support CPC. Um, they're not usually going to be CPC voters necessarily. Yeah. Um, like it might be pools of people from different places. So I just think there wasn't like enough, but I think 5% is actually quite a lot yeah. uh, in a sense, but I think it needs to be like, they need to get a seat probably like yeah. pile some resources and kind of do what the green party did to get may in there. Yeah. Um, but oh, he's, they're the just, it's just too fringe still. Plus they've got like, you know, the headlines around them aren't favorable. So any any normies, so to speak, who vote uh, just might not know what's up. I mean, I don't know. I, who knows why people didn't do I it. think it's in, like... In Alberta, they voted for them quite a lot. True. Uh, I think, um, I don't know, like the fact that True North showed up as a news organization gives me a little bit of hope for Canada. Um, I think... I think it's run by conservative party hacks. But they do have some decent content. 
a it's right of the CBC and it's not the Rebel. So yeah, I'll take it's it. something at all. Like, people just go, the Rebel News, ew. It's like, like kind of so-so once in a while. Like, what do you expect? This, we're making the best content right now. <laughs> That's how bad all the content is for Canada on a non-CBC perspective. It's just, yeah, like, there's there's some dudes in their fucking garages, and that's really about it. Uh, well, there is a... What I've noticed from running the uh, the West Barbarian Twitter account is there's a huge, huge fucking echo chamber of right-leaning Albertans who get on there and, and voice their opinion on uh, on any piece of news um, as, it, like, as it applies to the right. Well, it's a pretty small scene. Like, Alberta is this freaking tiny. Yeah. Tiny. So for anyone who happens to by some chance be living outside of Alberta, there's four and a half or so million people here. Like it's very small. Uh, I, yeah. Saskatchewan's like this. There's like 30 or 40,000 people in the province. Yeah. Like the people from Saskatchewan are pretty based. I don't know about Manitoba, but um, there's well, just man, out, outside of the big cities in Alberta. It's pretty epic, man. Like, did I tell you about when I went shopping in uh, Red Deer? No. Tell me. Like, no one wears the mask. <laughs> it's it's like being in Grand I would Prairie. say 80 to 90 percent of people know their face enjoyers. Yeah. I would say even 50 percent of employees were face enjoyers. Nice. Like, people were pushing it like people would be astonished from the city in the city it's just the faceless rabble everywhere it's actually spooky yeah i uh i wanted to go and get uh lunch with some buddies and uh i'm not getting it i'm just not getting it so i go and get this those rapid tests right so some guy sticks this you know this fucking shit up my nose 20 minutes later i have a a, a weekend pass out of jail so we go, we get something to eat. And uh, so I asked the waitress, I'm like, yo, like who, who gets upset when you ask them? And she's like, it is predominantly the people, the people that get upset are the people that are pulling out their QR code as they're fucking getting pissed off. They're like, oh my God, this fucking bullshit. Here's my fucking papers. Like, That's, that's because these people are the neurotic ones who are begging for it. Like they cannot handle the negative emotion. They've, they've, got themselves totally insane as we were talking about before recording about that Qatari thing with the long COVID people yeah, and the people who never even had the virus. They think they had all these symptoms and these people are nuts and urban people are way more neurotic. Uh, it's like that culture thing I was talking about, very different between rural and urban. This virus situation is not good for uh, urban people. I don't know how why they think they've got these like clean lives and they're so delicate, but um, they are insane. I like to ask those people if they uh, ever wonder what happened to all the Amish. Shouldn't they all be wiped out? Shouldn't the heterites just be fucking dead? Why? Well, because they don't get the shots. It's the only way to stop it. It's a pandemic of the unvaccinated, in case you weren't aware. Yeah, I haven't really heard about the situation with them. Yeah, they're not dead. They're doing just fine. Because they refuse to be told to stay in their home and away from their family and friends. They, they're going to be fine. This, Everyone's this gonna not, get it. This not going to church on Sunday shit is non-negotiable with these people. They would rather fucking kill you than let you stop them from seeing their friends, family, and God. Yeah, well, they uh, kind of get it. Like, there's more to life than avoiding a virus that isn't dangerous at all to the overwhelming population. And, again, the, no opposition, no principles. We A lot of this, so, this uh, non-lockdown opposition, they have no argument because they don't get it. Some people just do. And it's it seems very intuitive. Like some people that you'd never even expect were had any kind of political awareness. They just have the sense that everything's you know crazy once this issue comes in. 
uh, one thing we uh, that I was that I mentioned earlier was the uh, the phrase "joyous warrior," which which really stuck with me. The idea of it. Uh, it's it, it's not a bad way to get through this nonsense. That's that's because it's clown world. <laughs> clown world is real. I've noticed a a good trend uh, in popular, like kind of I wouldn't say popular media, but accessible media uh, that there's a lot more libertarian leaning individuals who get it who are um, in, in I would say, like, hip positions um, that, you know, are kind of pushing things in a good direction. Like, uh, uh, Malice is pretty good. Dave Smith, who hates the Libertarian Party, which is awesome. Uh, he's doing great. Um no, the younger generations, kind of, or I don't know, is it a younger generation? I but think I like, uh, age. yeah, I don't know. They seem good, and uh, kind of because all the old dudes are pretty old. I don't know. Like, do you remember Doug Stanhope? You ever watch him? Uh, he was, he was, uh, he did this this uh, New York like cellar club in a uh, in a libertarian jersey. It was fucking sick. And uh, he was, for the longest time, he was the libertarian comedian. Uh, and, you know, and along comes, you know, like there, there's just a little more hip media going around that isn't statist. Like, I would rather see 20,000 people that are into that than... um the idea that like millions of people are watching Ben Shapiro. Yeah, I don't know. People like Ben Shapiro. Why? I don't know. Boomer cons like him. They think he's a feisty young whippersnapper. <laughs> <laughs> if you start a tweet with uh, my wife's bedroom, then I I don't think you're a feisty young whippersnapper. You see that? He was like, oh, I went into my wife's bedroom. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I saw that. That was pretty funny. It's a little weird. He's just he's just a weirdo. He's a uh, he's pretty devout, so maybe they do sleep in separate beds except to have sex or something. I don't know how it works. I don't want to know about it. They keep their milk and meat in separate fridges. I don't want to know. It's pretty serious. Like, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know about Ben Shapiro's sex life? No, I'm a prude. <laughs> what, what about Abigail Shapiro? You want to know about her sex life? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Kazar, that's the funniest meme. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. She Ben uh, Shapiro. Ben Shapiro. He's so. What else did I have on my list here? Yeah, I don't really have anything else. I think uh, covered a lot. Unless there's a, a topic we can get into, kind of. But uh, I don't know. We had seemed like there was some good stuff in it. I think so. Are you, do you enjoy being the laziest supervillain the world has ever known? Not only are you white and awkwardly mobile financially, but you won't get the vaccine. That's pretty much a supervillain. Uh, no, I'm a superhero. I've gotten, I'm gigavaxed. <laughs> Max vax? Max vax. <laughs> I got, I got six doses of Sinovax. Honestly, if if you had, I to, got the original stuff that Trudeau was gonna get. Yeah, the secret shipment of it. <laughs> if, and I and I, and I injected a few. If you Sinovax, Sinovax. If you had to get one right now, which one would you get? Sinovax. Me too. <laughs> no, I wouldn't get any of them. Reshovax. Oh, the uh, Sputnik one. Or Sputnik. What? Vax. <laughs> they can't. They can't name anything. That comes out of Russia, anything but Sputnik. What about like Catherine Vax? I don't know what that is. Like Catherine the Great. <laughs> like here, inject some Catherine. Yeah, that's actually, but you spell it with a K. Do, isn't the Johnson one or Johnson Johnson? Isn't it called like Johansson? <laughs> Johnson. Johan. Johnson. I don't know. Jansen Jansen. Yeah. 
Janison. Yeah, they and they had a bunch of other stupid names for which it was actually what approved under. Uh, but just disgusting. There was some some like crazy conspiracy shell game going on where they're like, "Oh, the uh, the thing that they approved is not actually the thing that you can get." The the they renamed it, and that's the thing that they approved. But the emergency use thing is still applying to this and it was so convoluted that i was like this has to be either like so beyond me or full of shit huh. i would get the Cenovax though there's chinese people are still alive they're not dying like one to one to we have no idea we have so. no idea what that's the thing you have no idea to know what's the best one yeah or the least bad or whatever. It's just it's just an unfair situation. When you just get your single shot Jansen and be done with it? No. No? Gigavax. Gigavax. Max Vax. <laughs> Do you know that on the uh sixteen Vax? They looked through the uh source code for that uh open pass uh project that they had, and I think that's the one that Trauma uses. We may also use it. But because it was an open source project, uh, you could see everything in it. And it actually had 10 entries for the vaccine. And to be gentle, you could say like, oh, well, you just put a bunch of empty characters in there just in case they want to like continue on with stuff. And if that's the case, why would you stop at 10? Uh, but then the the like conspiracy side of that is just like, dude. They're going harder. They're they going more. There's, they're going to they push it more. as far as they can. And like people will want their boosters and um, people will. Uh, yeah. People will want their boosters. They're just going to go along with it. I lost my train of thought. Do you know? But I, I, how many, what percentage of the vaccinated public do you think will bulk at the third shop in Canada? Like 2%. That's it. Canadians love lockdowns, medical passports and all associated things. Do you think it will turn like it has in Australia uh, or sorry, in Austria and Germany, if it becomes mandatory and Italy? Well, that's what we were talking about before. It is mandatory. They've just they're instead of the iron fist, Canada uses the the velvet glove or whatever. What if on top of losing your job and not being able to fly and not be able to buy groceries and not being able to see your loved ones, I also find you two hundred dollars a month? Yeah, it, it's certainly possible. That's what they're talking about other places, um, and. It basically works out to like five thousand dollar fine because it gets maxed out, and you go to jail if you don't pay. So technically, you could like buy your way out of it if it ended there in theory, but uh, of course it wouldn't. But I mean, this whole uh, the whole I mean, who knows? It's it's crazy trying to predict anything about it. But this because this yeah. new one is so not deadly supposedly one death. Um, and maybe that will subs materially undermine this, um, pr prevailing consent to this campaign against the virus. Like maybe when the threat appears less to more people, it just kind of goes away or, mitigates a bit or lightens up or i don't know like it it's clearly unsustainable because it's insane but people can keep it going for a while i'm sure because especially in canada because again they love it canadians love it yeah and i want to clearly distinguish between albertans and canadians <laughs> It's another one of those like horrible scenarios where too much stuff has passed since the last time we recorded, but there's also something very monumental occurring this week with the, you know, the, the prime minister summoning all the prime, like premiers to this meeting. To talk about Omicron. The Omicron. Yeah. Like, and ways to make you safe. Like, Ottawa will protect you. How, 
like how Omicron. <laughs> I don't. We just don't know much about Omicron yet. So it's best just it's to be best safe. just to be safe. be safe. We need to make a plan to keep you safe while we figure out what's going on with Omicron. Don't see your loved ones this Christmas. Well, they brought in. The, I mean, the the, the jails whole thing are is ridiculous. Back. Ontario brought it back. Well, yeah, they brought back their whole quarantine hotels and uh, or their quarantine jails or whatever you want to call them. They're quarantine internment sites. camps, bro. Yeah, quarant- well, quarantine camps or internment camps. Like, yeah, they're horrible. It's disgusting. It's how can terrible. how can you test negative and still be in the camp? That's yeah. Not what's the quor- point of anything? The whole thing is retarded. And somebody but, got infected while they were there. But just the other day, uh, because. Oh, Ontario, the cases are going up very fast, very concerning. So uh, that chief medical guy or whatever, he gets up and he's like, whoa, yeah, you better be careful at Christmas time there. You, uh, if you have any old folks there at Christmas, you better make sure they got some masks on. And hope you know, they got just, a will. Just ridiculous. Yeah. And, oh, just make sure you have small groups only. Is he the same fucking guy who said the best way to combat uh, COVID was to stop uh, vaccinated, unvaccinated uh, commingling? Or is that some other asshole? I don't know. It all blends together. The sheer retardation of them all. I, The new one, best new one I saw. And then maybe... uh, work to a close but the new evolution is this lady she's a doctor so you should take this seriously okay she says what kind of doctor one of the biggest problems yeah is that people have to take their masks off while they're eating so if only there was a better way so what we need to do is is institute a silence rule while you're eating so that the vocalizations will not produce the magical virus gas. Oh. And at that point, it will be safer than it otherwise would be. So you wear the mask until you get your food, and then when you're eating the food, you don't talk because that would be the most safe. Oh. So, you know, again, never, clown world is real. Never thought about it and like these that. These people should be mocked into hiding for 10 years in sheer embarrassment, but instead... People think that's an acceptable thing to say. That person should want to like smash their head against the wall thinking, why did I say that? I am an idiot. But no, they get cheered on like, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, yeah, better safe than sorry. That does sound really if safe. it saves one life. <laughs> I'm, have you been watching because uh, Hinshaw is back to her, her fucking announcements every day? Yeah, it's uh, painful. I don't see them, but. You should. I know they have. You should skip immediately to the Q and A section because there's always the same fucking guy. It's like, uh, oh yeah, we'll, we'll just put through the next line. It's like, uh, hey, yeah, it's Jim Brown from Global News. Uh, uh, when are you guys gonna get a snitch line? Where's the snitch line? There is a snitch line. Well, where where do I use this snitch line? They're like call three one one. He's like, that's not. No, good there enough. is a snitch line. Is it? It's is, the AHS like report a violation. There's a big form, but uh, there's like phone numbers and stuff. Can you fight that? What? What all the complaints were? Yeah. No, I don't know. They would probably just stall. I'm pretty sure you can fight, but yeah, maybe. Just so you know. I don't know. Sounds like a fun afternoon. Why don't you do it? I don't. I don't foip. You should try it. I'm gonna. I think it's free if it's not a lot of uh, work. They well in BC they passed a bunch of rules to make it much harder to foip things, and it's actually quite expensive. Um, Nothing's now, better than wasting time that bureaucrats would otherwise be doing messing up things. The the Calgary Herald has foip information from the city of Calgary and. The city of Calgary fought it for four years. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And they have they have a department. They have a FOIP department of like eight dudes. Who, their entire job is just going through FOIP documents to make sure nothing sensitive is there. So the, 
The thing is, you could FOIP this information, but it's not going to have names. No, none, nothing matters. It's all like chipping at the edges no. of the system everyone accepts. Like, it's, yeah, it's too big. Like, you, you can't deal with it. You can have more transparency. You can have more committees. But it, people basically accept this system otherwise they just cut the budgets and nobody wants to cut anything They're like oh no don't cut it no 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 we need that it's very important we need it give it to me we need it yeah okay so hopefully we'll be able to record a little more consistently i doubt it no it it's the remnant did you read uh isaiah's job the Great Essay by Albert J. Nock. No. Okay. That is the greatest essay for like political thinking. Yeah. I think that anyone can read. So can you sum it in a sentence? It's about the remnant. So you gotta like understand that, but you gotta Yeah, you gotta you gotta get into the remnant. So it's not about uh, it's not about like convincing the masses. God basically tells Isaiah like they've got this king. They they're coming out of this like decadent era. They're going into like the downfall, right? Mm. And so the prophet's always coming in to warn people, and it's like, look, prophet, God says, prophet, you're not gonna turn everyone around. Like most of them are hopeless. You're just going for the remnant. So Albert J. Nock just takes this old idea of the remnant because it's this old kind of language. Yeah. And he applies it to the same thing. And he basically says, you're only trying to connect with those people who like basically know what they're looking for, or they'll basically find you. Okay. Like you don't find them. These are the best people because they, they're looking for this and just basically putting the flag up so to speak they will find it and uh, in terms of numbers i'm sure it's like honestly like thousands okay all right so that's it